Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two in the IBM 5170 series, I guess. When I started this series, I don't think I realized how much of a pain the IBM 5170 actually is. I've worked on a lot of 286s in my life, but I've actually never really worked on a 5170. So I was sort of aware of some of the issues that this machine can present, but I wasn't fully up to speed and I wasn't anticipating that there would be so many. So in this part, you're gonna see the struggles I go through on some of these things. And I've been working on this machine for a lot longer than I actually thought I would. So anyhow, without further ado, let's get right to it. So one thing that's strange about the 5170 that this machine here is not afflicted with is the 5170 only seems to have 512K of RAM. And it doesn't seem like anyone ever expanded it. It was very typical IBM sold an expansion card on it that would give you more RAM. But it's like no one ever bothered to get one and install it. It's kind of weird. And it doesn't seem like anyone had pillaged cards out of that thing because there wasn't blank slot covers on the back. So I guess whoever used it just only ever needed... 512K and that was good enough. So I happen to have, and this is something I've been holding onto for quite a while, a couple 16-bit ISA RAM expansion cards. Both of these are unbranded and they have lots and lots of dip switches on them. So I have no idea how the memory is mapped on these. What's important with memory cards like this is how they map this additional RAM into the memory space of the processor. Now, the problem is, is if these were in machines that had 640K of RAM on the motherboard, which is typical, then this memory on here would be configured to begin at one megabyte and beyond. It would start going up from there. Now on the 5170, I need the RAM to start at 512K and fill in that 128K that's missing up to 640K. And then the rest of the memory needs to map in to the high memory space above one megabyte. Normally, that's not an issue if you know what the card brand is. So you just look up the switches. And like I said, both of these are completely unbranded. Each column of chips here is 256K. So we have one meg, two meg, three megabytes of RAM here on this card. So I'm gonna do a little bit of research on the internet, see if I can find any of the switch settings for either of these cards to hopefully be able to start mapping them into that address space that's missing and then give me the high memory that that machine needs. All right, well, it didn't take me too long to figure out what this card was. And actually I realized that I already knew what this card was, but I took a look uh, at the part numbers on this chip here. I started Googling for them and it came up that this was the Everex Ram 3000 Deluxe board. And luckily someone had scanned this in, which has all the information you need on setting all the numerous switches and whatnot on here including exactly what I needed to know, which was the start address. So I'm starting at 512K. So it's uh, this switch here, switch three, six, seven, and eight. And then I need to set this to upgrade the rest of the memory starting at one megabyte. So that's uh, switch three, two, three, four, and five. This card was really designed for use inside a 5170 or other 286s, but therefore it actually has documentation on installing it into your 5170 specifically. Even has a diagram of my type one motherboard here, just making sure to tell you that there's a jumper actually lets you configure between 512K and 256K. So if I had, I guess 256K, that would be half of these populated. I could still fully expand this machine all the way up to, well, 256K plus three megabytes. That's pretty awesome. The documentation also talks about the fact that this does support EMS memory. I'm not going to use EMS memory. That was really used on XTs to get beyond the 640K barrier for programs like Lotus 1, 2, 3, stuff like that. I'm happy with the extended memory as opposed to EMS, which is expanded memory. You know, it's always a bit confusing. I'm not even going to bother with this card. If uh, anyone recognizes this one, and you can point me to documentation because I don't think I ever found it for this. Maybe I did. But if you do recognize this and you know the model number or some documentation that exists, please let me know in the comment section below. Here's the 5170. 
I still haven't tested the original power supply, so I'm using my known good one here, like we tested earlier. So that's hanging out the back, but we have the tested floppy slash hard drive controller, the repaired serial card. I have my postcard in there just so I can man or monitor the voltage rails and see the postcodes, the Everex memory card and the tested working EGA card and the tested working floppy drive is back in here. It is connected, although it's not screwed in. And I have the RGB to HDMI connected to the monitor here. So I think at this point, uh, let's turn this on. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention, when I was doing all that BIOS moving around with that 286 motherboard, the other one I had, I put on here the Type 3 motherboard BIOS onto this machine. And the reason for that is because the Type 1 and 2 BIOSes can't boot the three and a half inch disk drive. So I do intend to put a three and a half inch disk drive and to make it the A drive because I really just don't like booting these kinds of disks. They're just not reliable. Plus it's a pain to make and you do need the updated BIOS to do that. So I have two EEPROMs in there right now, which I haven't tested. So hopefully it works and I think it should. If not, I'll put back the original two chips. All right, here we go. Will it blow up or will it turn on? So far so good, I'm seeing postcodes. I think it's gonna work. Oh, this is, um, it's counting up the memory. I gotta fix the uh, auto detect. It's trying to synchronize the CGA mode. Okay, it stopped counting at 512K. Okay, so it posted correctly, so my EEPROMs worked. It did give me a 301 error for the keyboard, which isn't connected. I got a 601 diskette error, which is odd. Wonder why I did that. Also, system options not set, but it also only counted 512K. That all could be because the BIOS is not set to look for more than that. So I'm gonna have to run a setup utility in DOS, which is why I have my boot disk here. Hopefully we can get this thing recognizing all this extra RAM in here. It's trying to boot this boot disk here, it's trying to boot the floppy. So let's put that in there. All right, starting MS-DOS, so that works. That's fantastic. Now one could run the IBM setup utility to configure the BIOS options on the original 5170. It's a bit of a pain because it asks a bunch of questions. I have copied the program G setup onto the boot disk here, which is an alternative BIOS setup program. It should allow us to configure things and looks like it has some diagnostics as well. I've never actually used this program before. Oh yeah, okay, everything's, oh, it's loud. Everything is not set correctly, so it is what? I think right now it is just past midnight. Okay, so drive A is currently number three and actually looks like it's looking for a 1.44 meg as the second drive. So I'm just gonna set that to not installed right now. Let's fix the date and hard drive type. We're gonna set this to zero. All right, base memory six. So I think we're gonna say 640K expansion memory. Uh, I wonder how much is actually gonna be on here. All right, well, it's three megabytes on the card minus the 128K that's expanding, but I don't really know if it, I'm just gonna put 2564 right now. I don't know if it fills in the high memory gap or what exactly happens. So I'm just gonna leave it at that and see if that works. Math code processor is currently not installed and display type is EGA, okay. How do I get escape out of this? Escape. Okay, hopefully that's saved. It's rebooting the computer right now. Let's see what happens. Does it count more than 512K of RAM? No, it didn't. Memory error. Okay, well, I think the RAM card not quite working correctly. So obviously I did not get the switch settings quite right on the RAM card, so I'm gonna go double check my work. So I fixed the dip switches. There's actually a handy program that Everex made to help you do that. And then you tell it the exact options you want, how much memory is on the card, what you want for EMS and extended memory. And then it tells you exactly how to set every switch on here. So I used that, I got all the switches configured correctly, and now it's seeing all the memory. I also went ahead and I created a little replacement battery pack for this. So it's two CR2032 holders stuck together with hot glue. Of course, they're wired in series because this thing needs six volts or thereabout. And then I peeled off the Velcro that was on the original battery pack. And that means I can just stick that right here. 
it was very, very sticky, the back of the Velcro, so it, it will hold on to this pack without issue. So now if I turn on the machine, it's still acting weird, but I will show you what I mean. All right, so it starts to count up the memory and it's gonna count up all the RAM, the three megabytes on the card plus the 512K that's on the motherboard. So there we go, 3,584 kilobytes, but then we get an error 164 memory size error, run setup, 601 disk get error, still getting that, and also system options not set. I just rebooted the computer because it doesn't seem to be booting the floppy disk now. Yeah, you just gotta take my word for it. <laughs> it's, it's decided to stop booting. It was booting fine, uh, and I had the program G setup. And I was trying to use that to set the memory and all the various options in the BIOS correctly. And the program would run. And I'm sorry, I can't show you it even working because I don't know why it's just stopped booting here. But what would happen is I'd go to extended memory and I'd try to adjust that amount and it only lets you change the value in 128K increments. And due to a bug in the program, it would have, it would like start with 4K. So when I put it up to the right amount, which is like 2,900 whatever K, it would have an additional 4K instead of like 44K, I think 2,944, it would be 2,948, which is wrong. So it would still error out when you turned it on. And I read on minus zero degrees.net that there's a bug in the G setup program that causes that. And it's caused by the corrupt information in the non-volatile RAM inside the clock chip. So uh, there's a little basic program you can run to clear out the chip, which I did. I typed that little for loop in and zeroed out the RAM. But when I ran G setup again, it still actually had garbage data in those values for whatever reason. And I still couldn't get it set correctly. I think I'm gonna just give up with G setup and let's see about the original IBM diagnostic program, which sets the BIOS on this thing. Now, I didn't mention this before, but this IBM over here, this 5170, when I bought it, even though I didn't have the original motherboard in it anymore, it had been upgraded, it did come with these, which are the original IBM books here. We have installation and setup and the guide to operations. These perhaps have the diagnostic disc, the original one that can do the setup on this computer. So let me just move this keyboard and take a look. Let's see what's in here. So installation and setup. So this is probably gonna talk all about the setup program, but unfortunately there are no disks in this one. So let's check this one here, guide to operations. Here it is, guide to operations for the 5170. I go, I see disks right here at the back. There it is. Diagnostic for IBM Personal Computer AT and exploring the IBM Personal Computer AT. This disk here, this diagnostic one, this is the setup program. If it's a bad disk, it's not the end of the world because you can easily just download a new copy and I can create a new disk image. So this thing still isn't booting. Although it could still be that the BIOS, like the clock is so corrupted or the date or whatever, that, that was causing DOS to hang. I can run a little command in basic again to try to blank that out or leave the battery unhooked for a while. Let's see if this boots. All right, the disc sounds bad, but it actually booted, there it is. IBM Diagnostics. So this will be the version for the original BIOS. I have no idea if it works properly on this later BIOS I have on here but let's give it a try. All right, the date, that's good enough, whatever. Time is fine. Okay, the date and time is good, so we hit yes. All right, so drive A double-sided. Uh, I'm just gonna push no, because I don't know what, is there only one diskette? Yes. Is diskette drive A double-sided? Yes. Okay, that was simple. There are no hard drives, which is correct. Okay, all right, here we go. Base memory, 640K, that is correct. Expansion memory is definitely not 23K, so that is not correct. Enter the expansion size. As I mentioned, it's pretty easy to do this calculation. So we have three megas of RAM, so that's 1024K each. So that's what's on the expansion card, 3072K. We are giving up 128K of that though to expand the base memory. 
So that gives us 2,944K of expanded memory. It's basically that plus the 128K plus the 512K that's on the motherboard, which gives us 3584, which is exactly what we see on the BIOS screen when it starts up. So on this setup screen here, I'm gonna type 2944 as the amount of memory. So that is correct, 640K plus 2944, and that adds up to 3584. Why does it think we have a color display, a CGA? It should say EGA, shouldn't it? Oh well, I'm just gonna hit yes. During reset, if you receive an error, go to the testing your AT section. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there we go. Wow, this counts up the RAM. I'm really surprised at what a pain this is. I can't believe that G setup program is so buggy and the, no one has come up with any kind of alternative for setting it, but I guess you're just expected to use the IBM setup program. So I can see that it counted up to 3584, which looking back on the phone, if it focuses, is exactly what we calculated by adding it all together. All right, no memory error, but we have diskette error. You know, this is a really annoying problem. So it seemed like on this machine, with the BIOS that was installed in here when I got it, which was that, that mid-tier Type 2 motherboard BIOS, it would give me the 601 error any time I didn't have the original hard drive card here plugged in. But now that this is in here, but I'm on the slightly newer BIOS, the one that supports booting from 1.44 disks, which the original two versions didn't, it's this error. Now the reality is, like I think I mentioned, I don't need this card in here because I'm not gonna be using an MFM hard drive. I intend to try to get a something else, either a SCSI or compact flash card working on this machine. We'll see if that's even gonna work. But I think for now, why don't I just take this card out of here and replace it with a different floppy controller and see at least if that 601 error code goes away. Let's see if I can boot this disk again now that I fixed the BIOS here. Maybe with the BIOS options fixed, I can boot this and I can run check it. Cause I haven't even done a diagnostics on the RAM yet to make sure that it fully works. Let's hit F1 to try to boot this disk. I was thinking that DOS was freezing because of the BIOS options not being set correctly. Let's see. No, it just stopped again. This is ridiculous. I guess this disc got corrupted or has a bad sector on it or something. Ugh. All right, well, obviously I got Check It booted on the system and the RAM check has been running for uh, several hours. Uh, well, maybe not several. It's probably been about three or four hours and it's doing the fast or the comprehensive check, not the quick check, quick memory test set to no and it's on continuous passes. So it has gone through all the memory and checked everything perfectly. Total memory, 3.5 megabytes, 640K plus 2.875 megabytes extended, and it works. So this memory card is a win. It is completely functional. Not to mention this computer seems to be working very reliably as well with no issues. Well, let me correct myself and say that it's working when it comes to the RAM and the CPU and that kind of stuff still having issues with the floppy drive or something. I don't know, I'm still getting that error. You may be noticing I have this little small floppy controller in here, the one I was testing with on the bench. I had taken this one out trying to solve that problem. That freezing problem with DOS 622 was not caused by the disc controller or the disc or the drive or any of those things. It was simply caused by corrupted data in the BIOS memory location, the non-volatile RAM. So I had to, once again, boot into BASIC and run the little program, which you can find on minus zero.net, to zero out the BIOS ROM. And I actually zeroed out the entire thing. I zeroed out from one all the way to location 47. And that seemed to do the trick. Well, when I say it did the trick, it allowed me to boot into DOS normally and now G setup is working again and re-blanking everything, finally fixed it where I could set the expansion, uh, RAM, memory location, whatever the memory size that is to the right amount. In fact, here's everything I have set. So time and date, high density, 1.2 megabytes, no speed, no B, no B drive, no C, no D, and the base memory, no math coprocessor, and I have the EGA set special. If I control alt delete, 
what's going to happen is when it goes to seek, it's going to give me, it's going to give me diskette error. And the same old 162 options not set run setup. And really the most annoying thing is if I take this, which is the original hard drive floppy controller, and I put this in the machine, it doesn't change anything. It still gives that exact same error. I'd really like to keep the original BIOS in here and not change to a later one. But if I can't get rid of this error, I'm gonna have to do that. I have a three and a half inch disk drive here. This is one that I'm going to install in this machine while well, I was intending to. And I have this, which is a matching adapter, same color as the original drive. In fact, this, this plate down here is yellowed a little bit, but the drive hasn't. And these aren't yellowed, so it definitely matches. I had a thought, why don't I try connecting this disk drive so it has two disk drives and see if that makes this error go away. I'm kind of grasping at straws with this, but maybe this will, maybe they'll make the error go away. And if having two disk drives in here is enough to make the error go away, I'm fine with that because honestly, that's what I intended to do anyways. Okay, well, it didn't even try to seek the drive. It is connected. Let's boot up and see if that, if I could set the drive, maybe it'll seek and, I don't know, this is totally grasping at straws. All right, I'm gonna set it up for three and a half inch, 1.44 meg for the second drive. I had a thought that the diagnostic disc that I ran, the IBM one, is probably designed for the original BIOS on this thing, doesn't even support high density disc drives. I don't know, remember how it didn't even give that option, it just said double-sided or single-sided? Maybe that is so old, it just doesn't support it. And if I just need to download a slightly later version of the IBM disc, you know, make a disc, and it would work. But G setup comes, came out around 1988, well into the life of the 5170. So I guess it supports VGA and EGA and high density discs and whatever. If for some amazing reason that this works, what's left to do besides cleaning the computer is testing the power supply and getting something with a hard drive working on this thing. Okay, I don't know what's going on with this second disk drive, so let me plug in this black TIAC drive, which I definitely know works because I was testing with it on the bench. Okay, there we go. Sounded like it, the head moved as soon as it powered up. I think that means the drive controller or whatever sent the track zero signal to it. Okay, so nothing, absolutely nothing. I know this cable definitely works properly. Could this be a problem with G setup? It's gotta be a problem with G setup. Even though I, I set the second disk drive, it's it's probably, it's I don't know. I'm just thinking it's not configuring the, the two drives properly, which might explain why I'm constantly getting the 601 error as well. I think I'm gonna go download the latest IBM diagnostic disk, make that, and see if that can work with this thing. Here is a copy of the setup disk. And this is version 2.9 or something like that. I found it on minus zero degrees.net. Let's see about this one. It's a 360K disk. Hopefully this drive has no problem reading those. It should. Writing 360K disk can be problematic, but reading them is usually fine. Let's see what happens. Yes, I know, disk head error. System options not set, so it seems to concur with what we're seeing at the start of the screen. So, or start of the scene, start of the computer. So we're gonna do setup. This has a little bit more functionality than that disc that I had. Okay, here we go. Same, similar setup, whatever, date's fine. Time is fine. Well, that is curious. I definitely set the B drive to be 1.44 in G setup but this does not agree. So we're gonna say no, there are two drives currently installed. A drive is high capacity. Is drive B, no, it's not a 360K. Well, uh, why doesn't it have an option for 1.44? Well, let's just do three. I mean, it's compatible. Hmm. 
correct, yes. Definitely there's no hard drives. EGA, yes, we have 640K. 2944 is correct. It still says color display. I wonder if this is still an old disc. Maybe that was why it said 360K, because it didn't understand the 1.44. I know the BIOS that's in here is the, the later revision, the one that supposedly supports 1.44s. Uh, let's uh, say yes, and let's reboot. Okay, well, that didn't seem to fix any kind of disk error. And in case anyone is wondering about the BIOS version, the date is 11-15-1985. Checking minus zero dot net. Type 3 BIOS there, 11-15-1985. So it is saying 720K in here. It still gave me the disk error on the boot screen and said system options not set. I did notice something odd though. When I go to B, the drive does access. The disk in the drive right now is high density, so I don't think it's actually gonna read it. Uh, okay, it did read it. Even though it's set to 720, it's still actually reading the disk. Let's try running something on here. How about landmark speed test? That does not sound like it's working. Yeah, so it was able to read the, the directory, but I don't think it's gonna work any further than that. So we're gonna abort out of that. And I'm gonna put back in a 720K disk. Let's try this disk here. See if this one has files on it. All right, it does. Has a game, round 42. It's definitely reading it. So, all right, so it's definitely reading 720K discs right now. This game is not compatible with an EGA adapter. I just figured that out. We get this garbage display. Okay, I'm gonna put back in the original controller here. Maybe this will solve the errors, the 601 errors, because that's what I seem to have read. I am not really holding out hope that this is actually gonna work though. This BIOS is just not happy at all. 601, diskette error, press F1 to continue. Hey, at least it doesn't say the setup's not complete though. So the regular setup utility did do something in that regard. I am going to switch the drives around and I'm gonna set the A drive to be uh, three and a half inch high density. And I'm going to set the B drive to be a 1.2. And let's see if that sticks when I reboot out of here. I swapped the cable around. So this is the A drive now. And I'm going to put a high density disc in there. And we'll take this one out. 601 error. And, and it's not happy about System options not set. I mean, this thing is a pain, a real honest to goodness pain. Let's see if it at least boots that drive. It's got a boot disk in there, 1.44 megabytes. It's kind of interesting that as MS-DOS starts booting, it actually seeked the B drive and it was doing that the other way around. But it's almost like it's checking that drive. Yeah, look at that, it actually booted. So let's go, I think a check it is on here. Look at that, loaded right up. Off a high density three and a half inch disc too. It just, this, this, I, I am so surprised at the, the level of difficulty I'm having here trying to get this thing working. A drive, 1.44 meg, B drive, 1.2. It's seeing them as they are set and yet disc get error. And I'm using, well, Gosh, you know, I'm using what I think is an original IBM card, but maybe this is not the original card. And what everyone said when I looked online is if you don't have the original card, that you actually get that error at boot. I guess I have to assume at this point that this is not the IBM card, and that's why I'm having that 601 no matter which floppy controller is in this machine. I guess I'm gonna have to go do, no. I know this is the IBM card. This is the Gen 1 card. There were two versions of it. And the reason why I know that is on this card, there was a couple jumpers to change the base IO, the floppy controller and the hard drive controller separately, two different jumpers. And I saw a picture of the jumpers and it said gen one card, this is how it looks. Gen two looks like this. This card definitely is the gen one card. I see the, the same traces, the same markings, the same everything. This is definitely an IBM card and yet we're getting the problem. I'm assuming 
This BIOS needs the Gen 2 card, which I don't have. There must be a slight difference in there. And without that, I'm gonna be stuck with this annoying error. Okay, I think I've struggled enough with the old 5170 here. So I'm gonna modernize it a little bit. First thing that's going in here is this, a VGA all in wonder. So out comes the EGA card and in goes this. This card does have both digital TTL RGB and analog. It looks like it has maybe S video as well. So this can drive an EGA monitor if I ever have a, an actual EGA monitor, but as it is, I don't. So this will be driving the KVM, which I have on my bench there where the broken 5170 is, and there's a VGA monitor connected to it. That's just the easiest thing for me to do. Um, out goes the big, large, floppy hard drive controller that doesn't work anyways, and in goes this, which is just a simple IDE floppy controller card. It's from about 1990, so it's the oldest one I have. I was trying to find an old one. Uh, it doesn't have surface mount chips on it and stuff, and this is what I could, this is what I found. I'll be able to keep the IBM serial parallel card in there, the one I repaired, so this will coexist next to that. Most of the later versions of these had serial parallel game, stuff like that, built in. Oh, and incidentally, the all in wonder here, this is dates back to around 1989. So at least it's in the same decade as this machine. In addition, the IBM BIOS is just, it's gotta go. I can't figure out that 601 error. I've already spent too much time on it. So in goes this, which is a couple Phoenix 286 BIOS ROMs. I think these date around 1990. It allows you to swap the internal floppy drives around, which is a very handy feature to have, especially if I ever want to boot an original booter disk in this, but otherwise keep the three and a half inch as the A drives. Which if I move these cards here, I have the three and a half inch all mounted in its mounting kit. It's definitely not the original IBM drive, which the front plate, you couldn't tell that it was a, a drive and an adapter it had a solid front plate but at least the color matches exactly with the five and a quarter inch. I will also be putting a sound card and a network card in this, which are in the other machine right now. I have a Sound Blaster 1.5 in there, along with some kind of an ISA network card. I can't remember which one it is, but those will go in here as well. The chips I just put in are marked odd and even from the original files, but I'm not sure which is the odd and the even socket on this motherboard. So I just stuck them in I don't know which, if this is the right way, but I have a 50-50 chance of it working. Out comes the original IBM EGA card. I just can't use you, unfortunately. In with the all-in-wonder, here we go. Oh, that's an 8-bit slot, so I can't stick it there. Try number two, into a 16-bit slot. And I can just plug this monitor directly into the VGA connector. I had taken this postcard out, but this is a perfect example of when these are very handy. Because if you see the numbers counting up on there, then I know the BIOS is working. And right away I just see two dashes, which implies I have these in the wrong slots, or sockets. Taking chips out of motherboards when they're down there like that is one reason why I love this tool. This makes it so easy to get chips out like that. They're there's things close to both sides. If you try to lever them out, there's just not room. Okay, try number two. Okay, we have postcode. Just says one on it. Hmm. Hmm. That's suspect. Let's try this again. Well, it does just go to one. Uh, I'm going to take the video card out. It may be faulty. just stuck on one. Gosh, come on. Okay, I've moved the 5170 over to the other bench. This is going to be the most disjointed video I've done in a long time. I really do have to apologize for that. It's because I am working on this machine when I have free time and sometimes days pass between one segment that I've recorded and the next. So I have to kind of even remember where I was when I left off. 
I have given up trying to use the IBM BIOS, either the Type 2 or the Type 3, just because I cannot get rid of those 601 errors. So I popped in the new Phoenix BIOS that I found online for 286s into this thing, just to do away with those issues. But I wasn't getting this machine to post. It would come up and it would just post with a postcode of 01 and it would freeze. Well, I found the problem. The issue was the two chips you see in the motherboard here are not the two that I had a second ago in this machine. I had these two in the machine. And at least one of these is bad. And now I programmed these. I tested them by verifying with the programmer, no problems. But in this machine, they were not working. So I programmed a new set, moved the stickers over, which is why they look the same, with a fresh copy in here. Well, let me turn the computer on and you'll see that this thing actually works. Oh, and I actually have the ability to do video capture now because I have an open source scan converter hooked up to the HDMI capture device. There's a big mess of wires, spaghetti wires right over here, and it goes to my laptop. But at least when I turn this thing on, you can actually get a clear representation of what I'm seeing, and I don't have to film the screen. Anyhow, it took a little bit of time to get that thing working, but let me turn the power on, and you should see the nice, Phoenix BIOS startup screen. All right, so there it is, it's booted up. And you see it says uh, Phoenix BIOS from 1982. This is the most recent 286 BIOS I've ever found. Micro Firmware Incorporated, and it's showing, of course, all of our memory, 2944 extended, 640K base. For testing, I took out the hard drive controller, so that's why it's saying drive a failure. What is kind of cool is the CR2032 battery pack I made has been powering up the non-volatile RAM, oh, beep, loud beep, for basically several days now. I haven't touched this machine in a while and it retained all the settings. So that little battery mod did the trick. All right, so it says invalid configuration information. Don't worry, that's not an actual corrupt CMOS. That's just because it didn't boot with a hard drive or the disk drive as configured. F2 to enter setup. Here's the error message. Hard drive subsystem has failed. Well, it's not plugged in. And here is the Phoenix BIOS. Take a look at this compared to the built-in one that the 5170 had. And remember, this is using exactly the same amount of space in ROM as the original set. Like I didn't make any mods to the motherboard. This was a drop-in replacement. We have time, date. You can set a custom hard drive type for first and second. Of course, it supports all the different disk drive types. Oh, it supports 2.88 megabytes as well on your original 5170. Is that not fancy? Base and extended memory. Um, I think you do actually type these in. I think you push plus and minus on the keyboard to actually go up and down on those. Video adapter, VGA, EGA, got a few to pick from. Keyboard not installed, but there's more. Look at the second page. It actually lets us turn NumLock on and off, set a key click, which gives you soft, medium, and loud. You can set the keyboard repeat rate. That's kind of epic. Now on any 286 or above, if your BIOS lacks any key repeat and delay settings, there is a little tiny DOS utility you can run to set that stuff manually. Cause that is controllable in the keyboard BIOS chip itself for, for these ATs. Here is something that I was really excited about with this particular BIOS, floppy drive swap. So when you have two drives configured, you can swap them to create a bootable second drive. So that way, if I typically boot off the three and a half inch, I can switch this to use one of those original five and quarter inch boot disks on this thing as needed. Does, I guess, allow you to set primary and secondary floppy controller. I'm not sure why you'd want to do that exactly. Uh, you could set a boot delay. Well, how many seconds? They're up to 30 seconds. That would be for your hard drive to spin up. You could do boot sequence, hard drive only, or floppy drive or hard drive. And of course there is a password as well. So this is a really fancy and advanced BIOS, especially for a machine like this. And it's just amazing what you can do with dropping in a replacement chip. I know this machine doesn't have the original purity with the original 5170 BIOS, but I'm not gonna have that stupid 601 error anymore that I spent so much time trying to figure out with this thing. What this does show you though, is that it is possible that EEPROMs can fail in these weird ways where the computer can't use it and yet it programs and verifies perfectly well in the programmer. Not the first time I've run into this. 
I didn't immediately jump to that conclusion. I figured that that BIOS set just didn't work on this machine. So I actually made a different set using an AMI BIOS that I knew worked on the 5170 and it did work. But then I just kind of thought that maybe it was a bad chip. So I programmed a new set, both chips, and it completely worked, which is actually what's in here. So let's get out the old dead parts bin. And we're gonna throw this bad EEPROM into there. I'd also like to throw the bad tantalum that we took out of that card into here as well. And you know what, the other, there were two bad tantalums. I don't know where the other one went. It didn't go in here, unfortunately. All right, so let's switch back to this hard drive controller that I know works because uh, of course it has IDE on it. So here's a compact flash adapter. I'm gonna reuse this IBM cable. I'd like to maintain a little bit of the originality of this machine. So I'm gonna keep this one in here for the floppy. The only thing I'll have to worry about is on here, you'll see all 34 pins are populated, but if we look at the floppy connection, which is this one right here, it has uh, one of the pins blanked off. So I'm just gonna have to snip that pin off on here, otherwise I won't be able to plug this cable in. That pin's not used, so it doesn't hurt it to clip that wire off. And actually, of these two connectors, this one here, this is the floppy cable, so I gotta clip that pin. And now I can push this connector on without issue. There we go. And this is just a bog standard compact flash adapter. You can get these on eBay for, I don't know, $5, something like that. Oh, and I just realized something before I put the card in there, I'm going to install a Mathco processor, which goes into this socket right here. I have this 20 megahertz 287 here, which is a little bit faster than, of course, this computer can use, but this ITT chip should absolutely work flawlessly in here, especially at that slow six megahertz that this thing actually runs at. So that just pops in like that. I just noticed that this is way too close right here to the IDE card. That's a problem with these. So if you go to install these, be very careful that you either stick something plastic and thick between the pins on here and the card, or you can just bend the little slot adapter, which is what I'm gonna do, which should just angle the entire thing out a little bit. And now you can see that the gap is more significant. Oh, and unfortunately, I didn't have my microphone turned on. So the audio you were just hearing came from the internal mic in this camera, which doesn't sound very good. Okay, I'm gonna install this drive on the top slot, but before I do that, I'm gonna pop this cover out. And the way you get this out is there are these two flat blade screw screws on the bottom here. And I think these are what hold this in. I put the screws back in here so they don't get lost and I will be storing this down here in this empty space. You can actually install a hard drive down here. There's a half height hard drive bay under the disc drives and then you can hit put a full height hard drive here. So there's plenty of room for me to just store this down there. I'll get a little bag and then I'll tape it in there. And here's the three and a half inch disc drive. It's already got some rails on there. The rails are not the same exact ones from uh, 5170, but they're from a clone case or whatever. And yeah, that looks pretty good. The color's not, not exact, but you know, what can I expect? And connect up the cables. Nice, IBM already split the cable so that it can shift side to side. Very nice of them. And it needs to do that to make it onto the uh, five and a quarter inch because it's off to one side versus the three and a half inch. Very nice, IBM. All right, those drives are now firmly attached. I plug the power into both of them. Let's turn this thing on and see if it works. Both the drives just seeked. So in the BIOS options here, well, I have it connected where the A drive is actually the 1.2. And then I have 1.4, but why don't I go to swapped? There we go, swapped. That way I can uh, test booting off of a three and a half inch disc. Wow, so swapping them in the BIOS actually makes them seek in an opposite way as well. That is cool. I have two boot discs here. This is a three and a half inch one that has, I think G set up on it and whatnot. And this is the one we were using before. All right. Starting to boot. Will it actually boot? 
Okay, system is booted. So this is off the A drive. And let's take a look at the B drive and see if it reads it. And it does. So let me just run speed 600 off the, what is the five and a quarter inch? Um, yeah, five and a quarter inch. <laughs> and let's see if this runs. It worked. So that means it is definitely reading that drive properly. It's 1.2 megabytes. Ooh, 6.8 megahertz. It's so fast. <laughs> but the FPU is running there at 7.82 megahertz. So I'm not sure if that's good or bad or like what would it actually run at with the original Intel chip? I don't know, but at least it's working. Ooh, uh, what's happened here? It now says non-system disk. Did it really ruin my disk? Or is this drive having a problem? You know, this drive might actually be dirty. I don't even know the last time I cleaned it. It is booting right now, but I'm wondering if there's if it's dirty or maybe the mechanism is not good. I'm gonna use this 3M cleaning disc on it once this finishes booting. It's funny, it's not giving any errors, but we'll just give it a clean. Uh-oh, yep, bad or missing command interpreter. Let's just uh, give this a little clean. Command.com. All right, let's see if that helped the situation at all. This drive just might be faulty. I hope it's not faulty though. This is the only three and a half inch that I have that's this nice beige color that matches the drive. Yeah, diskette failure, darn it. What's happening here? I'm gonna unswap the drives here so it boots off the five and a quarter inch here, which I think is a bit more reliable, even though it's older. General failure, reading drive B. I wonder what's going on. Is this a bad connection? Fiddle with the cables back here. I'm using a little adapter to go from that slot connector to the multi-pin connector on the back of this drive. You know, I just had a thought, because this worked briefly and I was having problems with it the other day as well, maybe it has electrolyted caps that have leaked. I'm gonna have to pop the cover off and take it apart. For the LED on the front of a machine like the 5170, it has a very short little cable that plugged in the original hard drive controller. So to connect this to the new controller, or to make this work, you need to attach something like this that's an extension cable. And I did two together because I didn't have one that was long enough. And I recommend, since these don't always hold super tightly, to put a little electrical tape around there and also around here just to make sure it doesn't come off. And then at this point, you can plug this into your controller. But unfortunately, this controller here that I have, that I'm gonna use for this machine doesn't have a connection for a hard drive. I think originally the LED would connect to the physical hard drive itself. Older hard drives had a connection on the front. So this doesn't have one. But what I did is I took this adapter here, which originally had uh, this LED right here on the board and I just removed it and I installed a pin header on there because I don't really care about an LED on the back. And now, I can just connect up this cable right here to this slot adapter, which will give a nice bright LED on the front of the machine. Now I'm using this compact flash card right here, 128 megabytes. Keep in mind that some cards are gonna be problematic and may not work. Unfortunately, um, if you have one card only in stock and it doesn't work, you may have to borrow, beg, steal, whatever from other people to try to get a card that does work. And unfortunately, just because you've used it before on a different machine doesn't mean it's going to work on a 286. Uh, XTs and 286s are definitely a little more finicky and fiddly when it comes to what cards work and what don't. So you're just gonna have to kind of try different ones, unfortunately. There's something else about the LEDs in the front of this machine. They are old, very inefficient LEDs. And if you hook it up, to your controller or for instance, to the uh, adapter like I did, and you don't see any activity at all, it's probably because the LED works, but it's just so dim you won't be able to see it. I did swap out the LED. This is the old one here. I, it's just a normal rectangular one. You can still get these pretty easily. I swapped it out with another one that's a little bit more efficient. I used the diode check on my multimeter just to make sure that this LED, the original one was working. It is, it's just very dim and um, this one works as well. Unfortunately, this is kind of an old one too, so I think it's gonna be kind of dim. 
Now, unfortunately, I have an SD card in the computer right now that is formatted with DOS and stuff on it, but there's a problem. First, as you can see, I have the system booted up. Now, when you go into the setup, which incidentally on this BIOS you can go into even when you're in DOS, control all tests. So looking in here, I have some custom settings configured. Now, later BIOSes have auto configure. Now you're probably wondering how exactly do you get the information to type into here? Well, one way you do that is like, let's exit out of here, press F6 to abort, which should take us back to DOS. I have a little program, which I found, I'm not sure where, it's called IDE Diag. Now, this is a recent program, it's from 2000. So if you just Google for it, you'll be able to find it. But what this does is it enumerates all the IDE drives that are hooked up to the computer. And you can see here the Kodak TB 3.0, whatever that means. If we pick this and do general info, it sort of shows it here, hard sector, not MFM removable drive, disk cache, whatever. So uh, if we look at display geometry though, there's the actual geometry of the drive itself. Now the top one is the one you wanna type into your BIOS, not the logical one. The logical one will change depending on how the BIOS is configured. You don't even have to have the BIOS configured at all to look to use this program. You just, just set it to no hard drive, boot into DOS off a disk and run this. So there it is, 978, eight and 32. And this is 128 megs card. If we go into the BIOS settings, 978, eight and 32. Um, Pre-composition, this doesn't really matter. You could just put zero, or actually if you put 65535, five, oops, 65535 five, should disable it. There it is, none. So 122 megs is what you get, and that's it. Now, unfortunately, if we exit out of here and we look at the C drive, it is reading the disk, there it is. So this is the stuff that was already on this, this card. I used it in a different computer at some point. Um, there's a problem. And this is the good old problem with 286s again. So watch this, type IBM logo.ans. Okay, so there's a file that's from this drive, 968 bytes. If I type pcjr.ans though, which is a 2,290 byte file and I hit enter, it just hangs. Now this problem, I cannot believe it's happening with this BIOS, this BIOS from 1992, that this problem is existing. There's a bug in some BIOSes, including the original IBM 5170 BIOS we try to use with IDE, that prevents it from working pretty much with almost every hard drive. And there's what it does. It gives you not ready on drive C. I made a video about this years ago, which I'll link to in the description, where I talk about this exact problem. I was trying to get a compact flash card working on a 286 exactly like I'm doing here and I could not get it working. I spent so many hours trying to figure out what the problem was. And in the end, I did figure out what the problem is. Unfortunately, the issue, at least previously, and I'm sure that's what's going on right here, is the BIOS that's in this computer, it has this problem. Anything over like a thousand bytes or something like that, it never is able to read the compact flash. And it's not just compact flash cards, any modern hard drive, you try and plug any IDE hard drive into here, same exact problem. I don't know what the exact flaw is here that's going on, but this is the issue that rears its head and prevents this from working. I'm gonna have to swap out the BIOS again, a freaking again. This project has been an endless one that's just unbelievable. I'm gonna swap out the BIOS with the one I used in that video from years ago, which I think should allow this to work. All right, I have the TL866 Mini Pro connected to the computer and I have the programming software up here. This was the one I had put on this computer already. This is the Phoenix BIOS. That does not work properly. This is the one I used in that video. So it's a Quadtel Enhanced 286 BIOS. So U27 and U47, actually it's labeled for use in the 5170. I originally found these files on minus zero degrees.net. Uh, they were in a 5170 that someone had pulled the chips and copied them. So I'm going to burn these into these EEPROMs, and I'm pretty sure this is going to fix the problem. Okay, so these are the chips with the Quadtel in there. Let's turn this on. 
All right, the machine is working. Let's um, go to the setup. Warning, CMOS checksum is invalid. Yes, it's right. Okay, so this is the Quadtel from 1989. Looks a little different. Unfortunately, it's missing the swap option, which is really, really disappointing to me. I really was hoping to have that. Um, it has a power up speed, but that won't do anything on this system. Let's just set the floppy drives to exactly how it is connected, which is right now it's like this. It does support custom types. I'm gonna have to type in the custom type from that IDE Diag program. That's all there is to configure on this screen. So we'll hit uh, F10 for save. There are extra options in this BIOS. Auto park disk, well, we don't need that. Quick boot probably skips the RAM test. Built-in screen saver, which we don't need. Keyboard click, I don't really care about that. I'm gonna set the keyboard uh, repeat rate to 30 and a quarter second, which is the way I like it. And numlock, I don't know what auto is, but we'll just leave it to on. And we'll hit save. And there's the system info. Programmable memory, zero. I don't know what that means. Other memory, 3.5 megs. Coprocessor is there, 8287 and 8286. And I guess you do have an option for a password. Uh, you can enter a password, so we're not gonna do that. And park your heads which um, I don't need to do that. And obviously you can format, which is a low level. So that's kind of nice, that's actually built in. Actually, let's just go for broke. This, the, the card that's in here is bootable. So if this thing's actually working, it should boot that card directly. Let's see what happens. It's really slowly counting the memory. This probably does a more comprehensive RAM check than that other BIOS, which counted it up a little faster. Okay, it froze. So that means that perhaps this doesn't work. So there might be another problem. Maybe there's something wrong with this IDE controller card. Let's boot, oh, I put the wrong disk in. Let's boot the floppy here. See if it has the same problem where I can only read little files and not large files. I'm spending so many hours trying to get this computer working. So I hope it gives everyone a little solace that even I run into crazy issues like this. So there's the hard drive, it's definitely visible. And while I see the hard drive LED here is really dim while it's accessing it. So it is, it is flashing just super dimly. So let's see, type IBM logo.ans. Okay, type pcjunior.ans. No, it's working. Okay, so that problem is actually solved. Uh, we could test that by running something. Let's see here, I don't really, oh yeah, utils. Let's see if I can run a program on here. There's quite a lot of utilities. Speed 600 is gonna be in here. Okay, it actually works. Look at that. So definitely, definitely that other BIOS is not compatible <laughs> with modern drives and compact flashcards. Unbelievable. It's so new. All right, so recommendation. Use the Quadtel BIOS. If you're using a 5170 with more modern hard drives, you gotta use it. I don't know of any other BIOSes that work. I could test more, but it's a bit of a pain to keep flashing them. But for sure, that Phoenix one, it does not work. As far as this thing not booting anymore, uh, let's see, I'm gonna resist the hard drive. Could be that I formatted it on something else and the heads and cylinders were, were different. So let's just sys it again and see if that fixes it. Oh no, the hard drive LED does actually work. If you could see that in the camera, it lights up just, it just, <laughs> it's very dim. It's very dim. All right, system transferred. If I reboot, will this actually work? Unfortunately, the system is still just hanging. So I'm gonna try to figure out what's going on here. I have a feeling I'm just gonna have to completely erase that compact flash card and set it up from scratch again, which is no big deal. Yep, there we go, the system boots now. Basically, I just had to FDisk delete the partition and recreate it. Then I formatted it and it's absolutely working at this point. I think what happened is, when you use that card on different machines, I think I used it with an XT IDE, it auto detected the heads and cylinders and it probably didn't match what I just typed in. Even though I typed in what the card is reporting, it doesn't always match exactly. And then the partition table is slightly different and it can cause problems with booting. At least that's what I found. So just deleting the partition, recreating it, format slash S, there it is, system boots normally. Finally, the system is booting normally. You can then take the card out, put it on a modern computer like a Windows 10 or a Mac and copy all the files that you need, program stuff back onto it, and that should work. 
Incidentally, I'm using a 128 meg card. I think you could use a larger card, like a two gig card, and you could get 512 megs of capacity out of it, I think. Not totally sure on that. I'm just gonna stick with this 128 meg card. That's enough space for this machine. You know, I just realized, I don't think I mentioned what I ended up doing to fix the three and a half inch. This is a TAC drive in here. This is a different drive. That chin on drive has some problem with it. I took it apart, it's got two little electrolytics on it. They test fine. So I'm not actually sure what's wrong with that thing. It kind of works and then starts to fail after you use it a couple minutes. I'll probably switch out those caps, but they're tiny little caps and I just don't have any replacements at this time. So I just uh, cut my losses and I stuck this TAC in here, which is good enough. It's similar enough beige, it's slightly yellowed or it's a little bit of a different shade than the drive here and this uh, adapter, but you know what? It's good enough. To make the three and a half inch drive the A drive, I was gonna swap these cables around. And unfortunately, there's just not enough length. So unfortunately, I think that means I'm gonna pull this cable out of here. So the purity of this machine is getting less and less by the minute. The original IBM cable, it's out. Because this cable here has more length, it would allow me to keep the position of the drives, but, but have the bottom one be A. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna install this copy of DOS 4.01. And that's because I feel like on a machine like this, it's better to run DOS 4.01. It supports large, large hard drives and more than 32 megabytes, which is the limit on DOS 3.3. And the computer is frozen. What has happened here? Power cycle it with the power switch. I, all right, as I was saying, DOS 4.01, it's really the best DOS for larger hard drives but on older machines like 286s and XTs, just uses up less RAM than DOS 6.22 and 5.0. Oh, and speaking of hardware that I've had to switch out, uh, I think I had said I was installing that ATI VGA Wonder 16 card in here. That would be a perfect card because it supported EGA, CGA, monochrome, and VGA. Well, unfortunately, that card is bad. The EGA output works perfectly. Like I could plug it into, well, I had it plugged into the RGB to HDMI. Nice, crisp EGA image, perfect. But the VGA output was working, but all smeary and screwed up and not working properly. So unfortunately, I just had to take that out and I stuck a Sing Labs card in here from around 1990. It's a, a recent one that viewer Philip sent in. So it's old-ish, but not as old as that ATI card. And, and this only has VGA only, so another piece of bad hardware. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna drop to DOS here, and I'm gonna format the hard drive again, slash S. And that's because I had formatted it with 622, and I don't know what this DOS installer was gonna do to uh, try to install on top of the old DOS, the newer version of DOS. So first I'm just gonna do the format, and then I'll reboot, and I will do the installer for 4.0 here. I think this is actually 4.01. All right, I'm gonna run auto exec. I don't actually know what the setup command is, but I think this should start it without rebooting. And with that, DOS is installed and fully working. Here's the MS-DOS shell. So I think I'm gonna to need to end this video here. It's been going on way too long because I just keep running into issues with this. But at this point, this machine is working properly. It's to the point where it's configured to boot and do everything I want it to do. Floppy drives are working, the compact flash card is working, it has DOS installed on there, the RAM is working, it's working how I want it. Unfortunately, the purity's not there. I took out the IBM card, I took out the IBM floppy cable, the IBM EGA card is out of there, but unfortunately that's just the way it's gonna have to be. What's left to do, of course, is um, test out this power supply. We'll open it up, clean it out, check for leaky caps, things like that. Make sure that works, get that installed in here so I can stop using this temporary one. And then the, the top lid needs some serious cleaning. I need to find out if it's rusty. If it is, I need to mix and match parts from my other broken one that's behind the camera here to make one really good looking machine and get this thing fully populated with all the cards I wanna have in here, the sound card and um, what else? Oh, the network card that was in the other machine that's gonna go in here. And then I can finally try out some software as it was designed to run on this six megahertz 
powerhouse from 1984. So that is it. If you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't and I was rambling too long, you know what to do. You can hit that thumbs down button. Huge thanks to all my patrons who have been supporting me. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. And of course, thanks to Justin for bringing me this computer in the first place and well, rescuing this computer and then bringing it to me. Just amazing. Put your comments down below, subscribe to the channel, and of course, check out my second channel, Adrian's Digital Basement 2. Just posted a video today about a monitor. Yep, lots of monitor videos, but there will be other stuff as well, including candy reviews. I will eventually get to those. Anyhow, that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>